All right, so our next talk is uh, by Robert Gibson. He's a botanist who works at the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage in Australia. In his free time, he studies carnivorous plants in cultivation and at home and on travels in Australia and abroad. He has a particular interest in Drosera and study, completed his PhD study on the Drosera peltata complex. Part of that PhD project examined the pollination ecology of some sundews, and this forms the basis of his discussion today, Drosera flower behavior. So let's welcome him. Thank you very much. It's great to be here this afternoon to give this talk to you all. Um, just to double check, is this the right distance? How's this? Uh, just checking the mic. It's okay? Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, wrong answer, but anyway. Um, so, yes, so today I want to talk about uh, three key observations I've, I've made, or three themes I've made over about 30 plus years of studying Drosera. Uh, now, it's one thing to be able to grow them, uh, which I can do quite well uh, for many taxa, but the thing is, uh, the flowers are often a, a key part for both the taxonomy but also their interaction with uh, ecology in terms of their pollination. Uh, but as you can see from the sub of uh, the alternative title to my talk, uh, Sorry I'll Be Late, My Sundew Is Finally Flowering, highlights some of the frustrations that come from the flower behaviour of Drosera, uh, where they tend to flower for only a few hours on a single day, um, and it's uh, for me, it's a very much hit or miss whether I'll actually be home to see them. So there have been times when I've actually taken a pot of sundews with me on a trip on a weekend so I can actually <laughs> photograph the open flowers because I've left too early in the day to see the open flowers and I have committed myself to going to this particular event. So, um, so the two examples I've got over there highlight this. Uh, on the right-hand side, Drosera madagascariensis, which as you can see uh, from the lower photo on the right, uh, Certainly, is fairly easy to come into, into you know, produce flowers, uh, but it's um, yeah, not very cooperative, unfortunately. And the, the photo of the flower on the on the left is a former Drosera natalensis, which uh, I've actually yet to see with an open flower, but I'm hoping may change in the next few next month or so when I'm back home. We'll see. And uh, I've been looking at Drosera. Oh, from my early teenage years, um, and that's included doing sketches, taking photos, um, and basically looking at the plants both in the cultivation and in the wild. Uh, so in the early 1990s, when uh, the sketches in this slide were done, um, I happened to live on a wonderful bush block in the western edge of Sydney, which had native populations of Drosera auriculata and what will soon to become what would be named Drosera hookeri. Um, so the notes that I made is when I did the sketch of the Drosera auriculata flower on the, actually I forgot I had this, uh, <coughs> this top left corner. So I made some notes at the time about uh, flower size, the scent from the flower. Um, also at the very bottom here about the, um, the arrangement of the, st of the stamens at the time which were in contact with the styles. So basically it made the note about this uh, sundew having the ability to self pollinate. Uh, similarly with this variant in the Drosera peltata complex which after my PhD I linked to being the type of Drosera peltata, I had noticed way back in the early 1990s about something interesting with the stamens having this ability to bend uh, into uh, the, the centre of the flower so that the anthers made contact with the styles for self-pollination. Um, and also, too, during my PhD from uh, 2000 to about 2007, when this photo was taken uh, for, for that project, um, was certainly documenting, starting to document that with, uh, with the macro lens. Um, and this proved to be quite important because my PhD included some controlled pollination experiments, and so it certainly got me uh, to, uh, was a warning for me to make sure I didn't delay uh, tending to my sundew flowers to do these experimental pollinations on the weekends or the weekdays uh, when I was home in order to do those particular crosses. Uh, but it's all part of the bigger picture about how Joshua <coughs> flowers respond to the environment and as Andreas had alluded to yesterday, um, there certainly is a correlation with, with um, uh, temperature, um, 
in relation to either how far they are off the ground, uh, but also as I've been finding over the years too in terms of the, the temperature triggers for when flowers actually open. Um, and as we know, you know sundews have a, a, uh, the ability to self-pollinate, and many taxa. Um, and so I was able to observe over the years the different mechanisms, the two main mechanisms by which this occurs. Uh, and something neat I also observed uh, through my studies, particularly in uh, three taxa, three tuberous terocera in Western Australia, is uh, the ability of some plants to have flowers that have uh, their long-lived flowers and they have the ability to extend the availability of pollen over many days. And uh, the final thing I've been doing recently has been uh, just uh, using a, a fairly cheap uh, UV for a torch to have a look at the fluorescence pattern uh, just to see if that has any clues as to how the flowers may be communicating with insects to get them uh, do their bidding the right way. And uh, my travels have taken me to Western Australia where, uh, as we've heard so far during the conference, there's the galaxy of, of species that are there and how there's a very strong um, tendency for the plants there to be self-incompatible and thus to rely on pollination. So um, this example of Drossa miniata um, with the scarab beetle uh, was taken on one of my field trips a few years ago. Uh, Western Australia is a really amazing place to go. It's, uh, unfortunately, it's not my backyard and it's still a fair flight for me. So a lot of my studies with Drossa ecology have been based more on the sundews that grow around in my native area and also those that I've got in cultivation and that will also importantly happen to flower when I'm home. So the main thing I've found is the, the air temperature trigger for Drosera flowers. Um, it, it can be quite informative to know um, what temperature you need to uh, look for in order to uh, have the best chance of seeing these sundew flowers open, particularly, as I said, given that they open for a single, uh, single day usually. Uh, and there's also a correlation with light level too. Uh, and what I have found is that different species or different taxa have flowers that generally open at different, at different temperatures. And this can be important when you look at uh, the plants in the wild and see the chance of gene flow between different taxa. Uh, and conversely, uh, flower, uh, when flower closure is also uh, related at times to temperature drop. Uh, and it can be quite frustrating when uh, studying these sundews and uh, taking them out of the environment where they've actually been growing and, and flowering quite happily, take them to a new environment and watch the flowers close before your very eyes, before, before you've had a chance to fully document them. But more about that later. Uh, so getting back to the theme about uh, uh, different taxa having different temperature triggers. Um, so yeah, most sundews are flower. Uh, have flowers open between uh, well, a few hours either side of noon. The one main exception are Drosera bermanii and Cecilofolia, which have flowers generally open in the morning. So this can be important if you want to photograph the plants and flower in the wild. Um, and I recall a situation when I had uh, a colleague Doug Donowski visit me when I lived in Dubbo and uh, we went past a, a nice side of the Drosera bermanii with the pink flowers, the Pilliga red. Um, but we were there early in the morning to head off to the Blue Mountains and uh, I didn't bring my camera with me and uh, we went to this nice site and uh, the plants were in full bloom early in the morning and uh, I didn't get a photo of it and hadn't seen, seen as good a flowering of the, of the plants ever since, at least not in the wild. Um, another thing too is that uh, on the warmer days the flat sunji flowers are often open for longer as well which uh, um, can be very useful in terms of uh, having more time to, to play with the flowers and, and, do, and take photos of them. Um, so getting back to the idea with different temperature triggers for different taxa, I've got two examples. The first is shown by the two photos in this slide. So this is a site at Cranbrook, which is on the way from um, Perth to Albany. It's a, a really amazing site with about, I think, 25 or so taxa, um, mostly Drosera, growing sympatrically. Uh, and this was a photo, these photos I took when I was there uh, last, which was uh, late September uh, 2016. So it happened to be at a time when uh, there'd been a strong cold front that had passed over the area. And uh, yeah, the, the temperature was about 15 degrees Celsius or 59, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And what I found there was the Drosera gigantea had its flowers open, but the other tuberous drosera that were in bud, they were not going to flower until the temperature got a bit higher. And as I found through cultivated plants that um, 
Now, normally it's about 18 degrees. It really is a, a key temperature for many other Drosera to actually flower. And so there were plants of Drosera menziesii, Drosera intricata, Drosera macrantha. They were all in bud, but there was no way that they were going to have their flowers open that day. Um, and the other example that uh, comes to mind too was uh, in 1997 and 1998 when I was in South Africa with Eric Green who took me to a, a wonderful site at Ferncliff, which is in the hills just above Hermanus, uh, about 100 k's south-southeast of Cape Town. And in these peaty wetlands where you sometimes see original uh, Borgonius, you also get a, a, a number of uh, flat rosetta, well, rosetta evergreen tuberous, sorry, rosetta perennial drosera. And I remember how it was quite interesting to, for me to see that on different days you'd have different taxa flowering. So uh, things like dro plants like Drosera admirable flowering on different days to Drosera elysiae. And I, I think there may be some, uh, that may be part of the reason why that taxa that Sunday was not discovered for so long because um, morphologically it could look very similar to Drosera elysiae, but the flower structure, particularly the styles are quite are very different. Uh, but you, only, you need to see the open flowers in order to, to see that happen. And just before I go any further, I just want to just put some context to this. A lot of what I'm presenting today is, is a lot of uh, preliminary stuff. I've been using very simple um, equipment, you know, handheld thermometers, digital thermometers, my trusty digital cameras. Um, so all of this work, uh, I, I hope I can uh, pursue further in a bit more rigorous a way. But at the moment, it's really just the results of some pilot studies. Uh, so I hope you don't hold that too much against me. Uh, this is probably the key graph in terms of Drosera flower behaviour and temperature. So what I've got here with the blue line is temperature over time. So this is forecast temperature. It was smoother and easier data to get. And this is for 11 days from late June until mid uh, early July of this year from a, a local site uh, in Newcastle. And the main trends I wanted to show with this uh, graph is simply you get the, the typical rise and fall as you'd expect of daily temperature. Minimum temperatures uh, at around 7 a.m. At, at that time of year, which was around sunrise, but also maximum temperatures uh, about 2 or 3 p.m. Um, so a few hours after afternoon. And there's also a a bit of a, a trend happening in terms of increasing temperatures, both minimum and maximum, to a point and then a, a sudden jump down. Now that, uh, as you'd probably expect, is due to the arrival of cold fronts. Um, and so they pass over the, that area, that latitude, uh, about once every seven days. Um, and so with the, just before the, the cold fronts hit, you get the winds coming in from the northwest, which on the east coast of Australia means that you're getting effectively air from the desert or semi-desert coming overhead, so it's warm, it's dry, uh, and so it means that um, air temperatures are warmer as a consequence. Uh, and when you look at the um, some of the key temperatures, um, so I've got this grey line here which is about 18 degrees Celsius, uh, which as I mentioned before seems to be a key trigger uh, for uh, many, many drosera. And you can see in this example um, just four periods when the, uh, the air temperature exceeded that, uh, that particular threshold, in some cases for an hour or so. But again, as the cold front got closer, um, then that period of time of, uh, above that threshold was longer and also the maximum temperature was, was quite high. So I've got up to about 22 degrees Celsius. Um, that particular day in July, and uh, as I alluded to from the sub, uh, the alternative title to this talk, it happened to be on a weekday when I was at work. So uh, while this time of year, um, in June and uh, late June, early July, is not a key time for flowering of, of Drosera, particularly tuberous Drosera, which would be my favourite, uh, there still were some plants coming into flower. So it meant that I would often, you know know that the plants had flowered when I'd come home and see that, yes, another, another uh, flower is setting fruit, um, but 
had no chance to, to see it because I, I couldn't actually, uh, um, you know, I wasn't there for it. And I have actually, in preparing this talk, uh, to get some photos, uh, tried to coax a few flowers to open by exposing them to um, extra light through just a, a, a desk lamp that I bought from a local hardware store and also a, a small heater to see if I could get them to open. It did have some success, but there's nothing quite like the ambient air temperature doing that job for you. Um, and so the other thing I'd like to say about this graph is that it also highlights when you think about pollination and particularly when many of these tuberous sundews are self-incompatible, so require cross-pollination, you need the air to be warm enough for those pollinators to be active as well. So it makes sense for these sundew flowers to be opened at a time when their potential pollinators are also at their most active. But again, you have to be home to actually see that happen, or in the field at the time, and it can be a very chance event as well, as you saw from uh, Andreas's talk yesterday as well. And the other side of the coin with anthesis is flower closure. So uh, this example of uh, Drosera capensis uh, from a few months ago, um, just a document, you know, most people are aware of this, um, but it's just nice to see it actually captured in a time sequence of photos like this, just how rapid the closure can be. So, you know, the main closure happened over 14 minutes, uh, with full closure really within about 20 minutes. And again, if you're studying these plants, particularly want to see the flower structure or to do some control pollinations, it's not very helpful to have a flower that's closing in front of your eyes. Uh, now, I, I sort of have been known to sort of, you know, try to physically force the flowers open by either blowing on them or you know, removing sepals. It has limited success. Um, and in this case, too, as, like many others I've found, it doesn't take much to trigger sundew flower closure, and it can be a drop of about two degrees Celsius um, or a drop in light level or both. And as I mentioned earlier, it can be a case of simply taking a, a pot from the top of the shop of a greenhouse to a, a bench in the middle of the greenhouse or inside to a desk with a desk lamp, and you watch the, the flower close before your eyes. And sadly, it seems to be an irreversible process too. So it'd be interesting to see whether any anaesthetics might actually stop it from the work that uh, was presented this morning, but uh, uh, that's certainly well above my, uh, my uh, uh, level of resources at home. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's one of those frustrating aspects of sundews which uh, uh, yeah, have, to, have to learn to work around. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I found that there are two main ways in which uh, Drosera flowers self-pollinate, and it can be uh, they relate to two quite different flower structures. So one where you've got the, the ring of uh, the, st the styles extending well beyond the ring of stamens that surround the ovary, which is typically found in you know your rosetted, uh, often evergreen sundews, things like Drosera lisiae, Natalensis spatulata, villosa, also Drosera bermanii and Cicidofolia, um, where the styles actually bend in. So. Uh, as the flower closes. And the example I've shown here, which I'll illustrate with some more examples in following slides, is of Drosera dilziana. And uh, the, the styles themselves, the uh, purple, uh, uh, basically have put themselves in, uh, put the stigmas in contact with the style, with the stamen, simply by having some extra uh, bending of the filaments themselves. Now, the, the other style of self pollination mechanism for it is far less common from what I've seen. Uh, so the main examples I've found are plants like Drosera arcturi. Uh, so i just back, backtrack for a moment. This is where the styles are much shorter than the ring of stamens, so that would contain within the ring of stamens. Um, so which makes sense that the, the stamens or the filaments then have to do the work to bring the, the uh, pollen in contact with the stigmas. Uh, but the other examples which I'll show further are within the Drosera peltata complex with one exception and that's Drosera ramellosa, um, which break the general rule of tuberous Drosera being self-incompatible. So one sundew that uh, really frustrated the hell out of me to, to get a good sketch of it, and this isn't the best sketch I've got of it either, this is of Drosera chernervia, so endemic to the south coast of South Africa, particularly abundant in the Western, Western Cape. Um, it's uh, common as muck over there, but it's still fascinating because it's, uh, well, at the time in the 
90s and into the 2000s, still fairly poorly known, at least uh, from what I'd read. Uh, but it's got that flower structure where the styles uh, extend outside the ring of the stamens. Um, so that's a flower that's just starting to close. And this, just uh, to link this through to Andreas's wonderful talk from yesterday morning, this is the, the same location uh, at uh, Packers Pass where Andreas had that wonderful photograph of the, uh, was it the bee fly on the flower. Um, uh, and uh, the flower below is uh, at a site near the Tree Waters Cliff Dam, so well to the south, uh, so southwest, southeast of Cape Town, taken towards the end of the, the afternoon where the petals have moved in, the styles uh, have bent in further and again brought the anthers in contact with the, the stigmas. Um, now another way to get some valuable information about flower structure can be through herbarium specimens. So this sketch on the, the right hand side is of a, a plant that I sketched uh, from a specimen at, the, at Kirsten Bosch. Uh, but it's far better to actually have the open flowers, but then again you have to really time it to, uh, to be there when the temperatures are appropriate for the flowers to be open and thus cooperative. Uh, Atrocera bermanii, as I mentioned before, also exhibits this tendency or this ability to self-pollinate through the movement of the styles into the, the ring of stamens. Unfortunately, with this uh, time sequence of photos, I missed the taking a photograph of the starting position, which is when the, the styles are effectively sub-horizontal. Um, but as you can see within this uh, series, self-pollination generally is finished within this, the first hour after flower closure begins. So the, the stigmas uh, so have been uh, put in contact with the, the, the anther simply by the additional flexing of the apex or near apex of the filaments. But the other thing to point out too is just the order in which flower, the, the different whorls of structures close. So you've got the, the petals and the styles bending in about the same time and then it's only after the flower has self-pollinated around 12 past 12 or so um, that you start to get a bit of movement in the, in the sepals which then complete the process a few hours later to prote protect the developing fruit hopefully from the uh, uh, from any predation. Now an example from the Drosera peltata complex this is Drosera linata a widespread species that occurs as far south as Sydney uh, Again, just showing how self-pollination can be achieved uh, within about an hour or so after flower closure has commenced. Uh, and also in the case, uh, in this case too, the, uh, the filaments really track the petals initially, but then uh, just before um, the petals of apexes have, apices have, have reached or getting close together, excluding the flower from visiting insects, the apex of the filaments begin to inflex further and thus really hasten the movement of the uh, stamens into contact with the stigmas until finally they're all in contact as the flower closes up uh, for shop and uh, the sepals then begin to move in to protect the ripening ovary. And the, exa the other example I mentioned earlier, Drosa ramellosa. Uh, in this particular species, there seems to be some variation in relate, uh, relating to when the different flower parts move in. Uh, sometimes the petals don't move much at all until well after this process has happened. Other times the flower closes before, so uh, before the stamens have moved in at all. But again, in this particular case, the cell pollination occurs within about the first hour of closure. Now a bit of a sort of arm-waving slide here and a bit of Drosera porn with some nice flower photos. Um, why would the flowers have um, delayed cell pollination? Uh, well the main reason that's, well, the hypothesis is uh, reproductive assurance. So the flowers <coughs> prefer to be, be cross-pollinated. Uh, but if that's not the case, then a few taxa in tuberous Drosera, but more widely in other groups of sundews, have the ability to self-pollinate in order to guarantee that they will set seed even th if that is self-seed. So self-seed is better than no seed whatsoever. 
but that has consequences in relation to gene flow. It means you can get uh, lineages developing that, that where selfing is predominant um, and very little um, genetic variation. Uh, also, even between adjacent plants, if they all self, they're not they're going to really going to share their genes that readily. And it also means a single seed can have found a new population. Uh, if it assume, you know, finds a safe site and grows, it can then you know, produce seed through, through selfing to lead to much bigger, you know, to, to a small popu to a founding population. And I think I've seen that within some of the populations I studied for Drosera peltata. Now, the second thing I wanted to bring with this talk is uh, how sunflowers have the ability to extend the uh, time in which they have pollen available, and these are flower species that have, or taxa that have long-lived flowers. So whilst several Drosera are known for their long-lived flowers, it's only developed in about three of those, in about three species. Um, there's some of the, the sundews with the best, best known for the long-lasting flowers, sorry. Um, Drosera adelae, uh, with its wonderful arrangement of uh, stamens hidden by, protect, uh, not in contact with the soils because of the uh, the hooded uh, filament or connective, uh, but those flowers can last you know, a week or so. I haven't uh, documented this uh, or timed it. Uh, Drosera rupercola, which has wonderful, sweetly scented flowers, um, and these flowers open uh, day and night. And also Drosera vericata from the uh, south coast of Western Australia. But uh, those taxa don't have uh, the sequentially opening stamens that are found in at least three taxa, Grinitocola, Heterophylla and Marchantia, subspecies Profila. So I understand that um, Andreas has also observed this feature within Drosera Heterophylla. So I'll just illustrate those three taxa with uh, a number of photos. So the first one, Drosera Grinitocola, which is unusual in that the flowers are open day and night. So, uh, and each flower lasts about five days. Um, and they're sweetly scented. So when the flowers first open, and this plant is wet because it's rained and I had the plant outside, um, you can see that each filament has two thecae, which contain the pollen. The thecae are lovely, rich red. Um, and as the flower matures, so from day one, there's no pollen available. The morning of day two, so just before 7 a.m., there was pollen available on three stamens, although in some cases this pollen, uh, this stamen at the top of the photo, uh, only one DK that actually had opened at the time the photo was <coughs> photographed, but then later that same day the second DK had opened and also another stamen had fully available pollen. Uh, and then on day three and day four uh, all five stamens had pollen available and then the flower was about ready to close. Now, Drosera heterophylla, with its wonderful daisy-like flowers, with its multiple sepals, petals, and uh, stamens, and more than the typical five, also has uh, flowers that last about 10 days, but they close each night. Um, so that makes them a bit harder to study. Um, but, and generally open when the te temperature is about 16 degrees Celsius or more. Um, and you can often tell the age of the flower by, by how many stamens they've got open. Uh, when you see this, uh, shown by this series of photos of those were different flowers, but just simply to illustrate that early in the, uh, you know, on day one, flowers may have a single stamen open. Um, the thecae in this case are translucent white, so it's wonderful to look in and see the, the pollen yet to be uh, made available. Uh, then around day two you can have maybe two stamens open and in all cases it seems that they, uh, the, the stamens that open are opposite each other or sub-opposite so they don't have, uh, always have the, I guess it's to uh, make the pollen, uh, ensure pollen will be picked up uh, whichever way the, uh, the bee or the fly visits flowers. And then uh, as the flower matures you get sequentially more stamens opening in this case, uh, one just uh, starting to, sorry, that one there just starting to open. Uh, until around day, day four, day five, you get about the maximum number of stamens open. But they also start to, the older stamens start to lose their pollen too. So by day seven, day eight uh, or so, 
the flowers may have lost their pollen entirely and effectively uh, may be now in a female phase, so I've yet to, yet to check whether the, the stigmas are actually receptive at that stage or not. And similarly with Drosera marchanti, our subspecies profiler, which has the more typical flower uh, geometry of five petals, sepals and stamens. Um, it's very close related to Drosera heterophylla, and in fact the two have been crossed experimentally in cultivation. Uh, and you can see here, in this case, the VK are a lovely orangey red. Um, so around day one, you get one stamen open with that lovely um, orangey pollen. And as the flower matures, you get progressively more stamens opening. And also some of those stamens begin to lose their pollen too until eventually towards the middle of you know, day seven, day eight or so, the flowers may have lost their pollen entirely and effectively be possibly in their uh, female phase only. Um, and using that information, again, you can see with this uh, photo of the inflorescence that uh, this is a much older flower. It's effectively, you know, it has very little pollen left to give, but this flower is really just starting. It's only got two, uh, so three open stamens, two, two yet to open. And this is the, the flower that's only just starting to open uh, on day one. And the, the last thread of this talk is a little bit more arm waving uh, in terms of Drosera UV fluorescence. So I was inspired by papers I'd read from the early 80s about uh, you know, UV, uh, the appearance of carnivorous plants under ultraviolet light. And I was never able to either afford, uh, in some cases, or, or to get to work some of the UV pass filters that they were using it for those uh, papers or that, that, that research. So uh, until, um, and I've been looking at that for some time, it was only a few years ago when a friend suggested um, the use of simply using a UV flashlight. Um, so they are uh, uh, readily available on eBay. Um, so it's you know, 395 nanometers, which is just to the uh, um, right in this case of the visible spectrum. Um, and it's sort of not the, not the more dangerous part of the UV spectrum because uh, you do need to be careful with uh, UV light, particularly skin and eyes. And so it's not, the, not the, the nastiest form of UV light, but it always is good just to have a little bit of caution when using it. And all I did was I would um, bring potted plants in that were flowering into a study that I was able to, to darken uh, and to set up my camera on a tripod, use a flashlight, or, or use the, the uh, the flash of the, the camera in order to get the visible light photo and then with the camera in the same position then just simply um, disengage the flash of the camera and just change the, um, the timing of the camera, uh, the, the aperture, um, sorry the shutter speed because um, there's a lot, a lot less light coming through a UV torch than there is a typical torch uh, and, and just set up a, a comparative photo. So. The thing that really stood out to me was how dull it really was. It was not exciting at all. I, I, was, I was thinking that uh, I'd, I'd see some pretty amazing features and I, I, my sampling has been very limited so far, so maybe that will happen. Um, but in this case of this uh, hybrid pygmy sundew, which in the Natigula complex has the lovely uh, red stigmas, um, looks really good under uh, normal light, but uh, under reflected UV, under UV or UV fluorescence, it's not very exciting at all. Um, now it may be that um, you know, it's different if we could look more accurately as how insects see the world, but this is, a, I guess, a cheap and dirty way of, of, of doing that, just to get an idea of what may be happening. Um, but yeah, it was a little bit disappointing, to be honest. But there was one, uh, one thing that I did uh, discover that was, uh, did see that was quite nice. Um, so with these three, three examples, two of which are I show the fairly um, well, unexciting results uh, for Drosera binata, Drosera zigzagia, but uh, some of the pygmy sundews uh, held a, a pleasant surprise, and that is where fresh pollen can fluoresce brightly under UV light. So I thought, yay, it's something, it's a result. <laughs> um, but I haven't looked at some of the tuberous Drosera which have got the exudates on the stigma, so um, I'll look forward to doing that because I know that's work that Andreas has done and. Uh, so that can be exciting too. So, um, so the, the conclusion from that uh, brief experiment looking at uh, UV fluorescence patterns uh, on Drosera flowers is that um, 
It's not a terribly exciting uh, result, at least up to human eyes. Uh, who knows how insects truly see the world? Um, but uh, you know, there can be some highlights in terms of uh, fresh pollen uh, probably acting as a guide to help direct the, the, flower, the insects to visit the flowers in a certain way to facilitate pollination. Um, but it, it appears from this result how uh, visible light is uh, uh, patterns are, are far more important perhaps in directing insect behaviour. Um, but again, it's, it's preliminary work with a, a fairly simple uh, apparatus. So to conclude, um, I've certainly been able to document with uh, some fairly simple mechanisms, some simple equipment, how some sundew flowers respond to temperature and particularly finding out about a, a critical uh, threshold temperatures. Uh, which can be important if you're planning to do uh, field work or planning to do lab work, uh, relying on plants to be, have open flowers for you to actually play with or to photograph. So I now know that uh, if the, the cold front is coming on a Friday evening and it's probably not a good idea to, uh, to go travelling to a certain site in the field if I want to see the open flowers because there's not going to be anything flowering in winter and spring, much to my... Uh, <laughs> uh, annoyance, but uh, there's not much you can do about it, but at least you can plan for that. Um, and also just uh, been able to document some of the mechanisms that some of the sundews have got to uh, for, have reproductive assurance through mechanisms of, of self-pollination. And uh, the thing that's been really neat for me is to see how a few tuberous drosera taxa have these sequentially opening stamens in order to extend the availability of pollen over the life of these long-lived flowers so that they're in their co-sexual phase for far longer than they would otherwise be if all the, if all the stamens open on day one there's a chance the pollen will either be removed by, by visiting insects or washed off uh, and so the flowers would uh, not be available to contribute pollen to other flowers if they behaved in a typical way to other drosera. Uh, and as I mentioned with the UV fluorescence, uh, it wasn't terribly exciting but I still think it's informative. Um, but yeah, I do look forward to having a look at some of the tuberous drosera with their UV exudates to see what, uh, what that looks like. Um, and, I, and I think too, just more broadly, how the study of uh, Drosera flower behaviour can help to inform uh, how these sundews interact particularly with potential pollinators uh, and also have, uh, you know, how they uh, have the ability or extend the ability to exchange genes with their uh, adjacent plants uh, so that fits into phylogeny as well. Uh, so a bit more plant porn with uh, in relation to the, uh, the flowers. So a nice form of Drosera glandulidra from up in Eniaba with that nice dark centre. Uh, Drosselacchio, which I like, it's a beautiful sundew, it doesn't like my conditions so much, but uh, it's nice when it flowers. Uh, and Drosera porciflora, which grows uh, very, very well in Newcastle for some reason. Um, but now that I've, uh, you know, haven't been, had much seed from it, but uh, from Andreas's talk, I'll, I'll know to uh, uh, collect some pollen and put it in the fridge so that I can uh, get some seed from uh, these lovely plants uh, over the coming spring. And finally, I did finally see the open flower Drosera madagascariensis. It took many years, but I finally did it. Uh, I also want to thank Arthur too for his advice on this species because it's been uh, uh, yes, uh, a bane of mine, but uh, there was light at the end of the tunnel. So I thank you for your time and uh, any questions? Yes, ma'am, I'm Larry. Uh, no, I can't actually. Um, <laughs> it's not something I've, I've, I've looked at in any detail. So, but it's an interesting question because yes, the grains become very uh, well separated so quickly after anthesis commences. So, um, but no, uh, maybe someone else has some ideas on that one. Yes, Andreas.
perhaps not, in a, well, not deliberately, uh, and I say that because there were times when I would, in bringing the sundew from the greenhouse or the terrarium to my study, there's a chance that it might have got whacked, you know, whacked the scape on, on something as I was moving it down the stairs. So that may be part of the, rap, you know, may have already commenced the closure as well as the, the drop in air temperature. So that's something to look at in future. Thanks for that. Yes? I suspect some of the factors that may be involved there could be um, plants have gone through a genetic bottleneck where they basically lost most of the variation and so there may not be much difference between cross-pollen and self-pollen within that, that taxon or that, that population. So uh, particularly if resources remain scarce, um, you know, the, the, it's not, there's not much difference in quality of seed between the, the outcross and the self. That might be something behind it. John? Yeah, I've also thought of something similar in relation to the cloud that precedes a, a cold front and also the chance of rain increases when you get a cold front passing overhead too. So um, you often get a cloud band, a high, a high level cloud band, you know, maybe even a day before the main cold front arrives. So uh, even though the air temperature might be relatively warm or maybe even warmer than the day before, uh, because of that cloud cover that may lead to some sundew flowers not opening, even though the air temperature seems to be above that threshold. <laughs> Larry? You may have said this, um, are the flowers that stay open for 10 days uh, uh, self incompatible? They are sort of compatible and, and the way that they produce their, uh, their extended pollen um, availability is simply by uh, only having them open on uh, uh, staging the, the, the sequence of them opening so that some are only, um, uh, there'll be new pollen available when the first anthers that have opened will be, uh, may, may have lost their pollen through uh, predate, uh, through loss from insects or through uh, to rain. So it's, they're not, they've only got one crack of the, one roll of the dice as it were. But, so it's, they simply, I guess it's hedged their bets by um, staging the opening of, this, of those, each of those uh, stamens in order to pr uh, present uh, 
the problem over a longer period. Does that answer your question? I think it was my response might be a bit clunky. Anybody else? Yes? It could be. Um, I, I guess the, the trick would be, as Damon did at the Splinter Hill Bog, is to, to set up camp and look at uh, flowering population over a 24-hour period and, and see what visits the flowers. Uh, but certainly the combination of the scent, the highly reflective white petals would suggest that they could be you know, attractive for moths to visit. So who knows? <laughs> Sounds good. Yes? I'm not sure about the, the gel over the flowers, but certainly over the developing stolen. Uh, to prevent your river. <laughs> 